tell me a little bit about Blue Mountain School hmm. the story. I think that Blue Mountain School started very organic with a bunch of people that weren't happy with what was offered in the public schools and they homeschooled and then it was kind of like well why don't we homeschool together why don't we have our own school so it was initially a completely parent co-op school and went through many transformation and metamorphosis um, and I worked here years and years ago and you couldn't really tell the difference before the philosophy was edged out a little bit more and the curriculum's ideas it was pretty much depending on who was involved in terms of who was staff right. and what kind of parents were behind it and it really changed um, from semester to semester as one crop of students graduated and those parents left the flavor of the school really changed and then when Shelley took over as I think she was probably our first real official director paid position and this this red thread this common idea just started to weave throughout the whole school and I think that um, shared readings and just talking about our shared ideas and the, the, the big picture really brings this community together and allows the school to be more cohesive and um, it doesn't change as much. Um, while there's still flexibility and adjustment and growth, it, doesn't, it isn't as haphazard as it might have been you know, 20 years ago. So talk a little bit about the, the contemplative progressive model. What is that like? I mean, what is it like to be in that kind of environment, that kind of climate as a teacher? Um, I have never taught at a, at a public school. My field is uh, strongly based in early childhood development. So, and there's always this kind of, I think, discord between the educators and early childhood educators, because most early childhood educators come from a developmental point, while many teachers come from an academic point. And so what, what I can tell about how I feel here and how it works for the kids is it allows me to teach the way that is best for the children, is to be respectful with them, to work on relationships, to, to consider them as, as valuable input in their learning and as active participants in their learning. Um, so that the model just kind of, I'm not real sure about the whole theoretical back of it, but it feels right because it allows me to do what is right by the child. Um, instead of having to be so focused on, I gotta get through this lesson plan, which sadly happens even in preschools, you know, two and a half year olds need to know their ABCs and all that silly business, which is developmentally not where they need to be. We can really work on, on developing a person, not just filling an empty vessel with, okay, this is a uppercase A, lowercase A, this is red, this is blue, triangle, square, but just through, through ongoing exploration in the classroom and outside of the classroom, just does that make sense like yeah. I feel like that um, and as far as yeah so I, whether that's the theory or not in a larger school for me in, in a preschool there is only one way to do it right and that's to see where the child is developmentally and to encourage those areas of growth um, and I think that one of the examples I use with parents is if if I tell you hey there there's a, a a, a course going on, they're going to teach us French for grown-ups. Wouldn't that be great? And you're like, oh, I want to learn French. But then you get a notice from your mortgage company, they're going to kick you out of the house. You're not going to be in a place in your head to be able to learn French. You need to be okay as a person. You need to know that my mortgage is paid, my bills are paid, I got food on the table, I'm healthy, I'm liked, I'm accepted. Now, what about Pauline Français? Now we can get into that. Right. And with children, it's the same thing. We have these children that have so much going on in their lives, and we, we don't appreciate that or even consider it and say, okay, well, now it's school and this is what you need to do. And while I do agree that kids can wear many hats and they're a different personality in school, there also needs to be a place and a time for them to be human and to be heard and reflected and, and understood and accepted. And when that is, you know, when that is set, then they can learn. Then they can go into the academics. And talk about... Um one of the signs I see on a lot, I've seen a lot around here is I'm not a teacher, I'm an awakener. Talk about what that means. What, what does it mean to be an awakener? Well, those are actually signs I, I, I forgot who it is by. Uh -huh. uh, but that's something that I did last year for our beginning of the year. I actually printed all those out and gave them to every teacher because I felt it was such an expiring uh, quote. I, I don't want it. The teacher is a little bit to be, um, I have knowledge and I want to, impart that while the awakener is I have the knowledge and I want to awaken you to also seek that 
right. so it's already there children are naturally curious they want to learn you know if you put them in a vacuum they're still going to find something i mean the, the the teeny tiny infant that crawls around and finds a fuzzball on the floor and looks at it and eats it what is that but learning you know that's the scientific method you know what, what if i pick up this fuzzball will it taste the same than that fuzzball yeah. you know it's already innately there and by awakening that or allowing it not to die in, in all reality, I think then we can keep this, we can sustain this love of learning and this ongoing interest and in figuring out what the world's about. All right, perfect, thanks. That was great. Yeah? Yeah. Hey, you're a good talker. So